Good morning. That's a good response. I'll take that. <laughs> Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Marilyn Gay. My pronouns are she and her. And um, I thought it would be um, interesting to mention that I am one of the members of our church board, as are Zoe Larson and Lynn Wolf. Lynn, I think, is behind the glass over there. Uh, and, and Susan Rutan, yes, yes. And we, Brandy. Oh, Brandy's here. I didn't, you know, I wasn't in the lobby long enough to spot everybody. Oh, look, and there's, there's one of our, Andrew is up there. We have a good representation from our board today. And we have the intention to be more visible and approachable at our Sunday services. So there's Lynn. Yep, she's waving now too. Okay, we've got, uh, good representation from our board, and we're all very open to your questions and comments. Ah, my pronouns are she, her, and I'll be your service leader this morning. The Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace, embrace a pluralist philosophy, opening our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of our world community. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, however you identify, you are welcome here today. We respectfully acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota, Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Asajanabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence and enrich our vibrant community. We ask you to take a moment now to quiet any um, gizmos you may have in your pocket that could create a disturbance, and um, then we can concentrate on our service together without distraction. For those who are hearing impaired, the ushers, ushers, wave your hand. <laughs> I think Rosemary is an usher today, um, also can provide you with an audio aid. Um, we're glad to have you with us this morning, either in person or on Zoom, or in the future, uh, picking up on one of our services through our website. We hope you find something in the service today that nourishes your spirit and helps you find and or keep your balance. Now, um, we have some announcements. We want to um, bring them to the, to the uh, program early in the game here. The announcement that I have, now I know many of you are very aware and concerned about the um, conflict in the Middle East between Gaza and Israel, and um, there are many events in the city that you could take part in, marches, protests, demonstrations, vigils. Uh, the one that I will bring to your attention tonight at five o'clock, people are going to be gathering at City Hall silently with candles. No banners, no placards, no chants. We're only coming together to uh, insist that there be a ceasefire and to point out the importance and the, the desperate need for peace. So um, if you'd like to come, and reflect with us for an hour in the cold, in the dark. <laughs> um, it would be a meaningful experience. Now, Reverend Rosemary has several other announcements that she can bring to you. Thank you, Marilyn. Right, I'm, I am indeed Reverend Rosemary. That is my name, or Rosemary, or... Reverend Morrison, whatever you decide to call me. Um, and I would wish to greet you and say good morning and welcome you to this service this morning. Whether, as Marilyn said, you're here in person in the sanctuary or online 
or visiting by YouTube later on. My first announcement is this coming Friday, we're going to have a spaghetti dinner here in Keeler Hall. And so for, I'm, I'm calling them Fridays there for food and fellowship. So my idea is you can come on a Friday after work and there will be dinner prepared for you here along with others to chat with and talk with. And then there we have a member by the name of Tanya Vandenberg who used to, when karaoke was all the rage, she used to be a karaoke host. So her and I are going to host a karaoke evening, come whether you like karaoke or not, or whether or not you wish to sing, because we will need an audience, and uh, whether or not you'll enjoy it is up to you. <laughs> <laughs> and your attitude. <laughs> of course, not everything will be on key, but that's the part of the fun of it. The last Sunday of this month is a um, national service. It's the Canadian Unitarian Council National Service. After the service is, um, you may recall, every year uh, around this time, towards as we get towards December, we decorate. Uh, Gordon calls it decking the halls, and we green up the sanctuary and the and the lobby and we are going to need help. So to bring you out for the national service, um, there will be a few of us cooking a pancake breakfast for you that you can sit in the sanctuary and eat while you watch the national service and then stay to help decorate the halls. So I will need help for both of those events. And so I hope that you can come and have fun. The idea for these things is just to have fun, get to know one another in, another, in a more fulsome way, I suppose, and uh, share a laugh and a story. Those are my announcements. Um, we'll open the service with a prelude. Karen Mills, our pianist, has selected a song for your enjoyment. You, Karen. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> now we reach the part of our service that um, brings us to the lighting of our chalice. And I've asked Rosemary Falconer to come forward and light the chalice while I read these words. The Chalice Lighting of Our Being by Richard S. Gilbert. Each morning, we hold out our chalice of being to be filled with the graces of life that abound. Air to breathe, food to eat, companions to love, beauty to behold, art to cherish, causes to serve. We give back, if we can, something of ourselves, some love, some beauty, some grace, some gift. We give back in gratitude, if we can, something like what is poured into our chalice of being for those who abide with us 
and will follow. Each morning, we hold out our chalice, hold out the chalice of our being to receive, to carry, to give back. Thank you, Rosemary. I'm learning about the holiday of Diwali, celebrated in India and other East Asian countries. And this is the season of Diwali. It's a five-day celebration. And um, the, the feature that's most prominent in that celebration is the lighting of candles and oil lamps. The lighting of those candles is meant to symbolize the triumph of good over evil. So let us add another layer of meaning to the lighting of our chalice today. Now we all sing together. Hymn number 389, Gathered Here. 389, the words are also going to be shown behind me. Can I, oh, there we go. So we're going to sing it together through once, and it's a round. So um, how, how many know this, have done it? Oh, okay. Should be good. Should be really good. This team and this team. If you want to sing on this team, you guys sing on this team. There, are, there's a few, few, and please rise as you are willing and able. You folks in. You probably need to leave my mic on. Take together. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one small body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered Gathered here in one small body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, Gathered here in the strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit drawn near. I think that went about as well as could be expected, <laughs> or maybe a little better. No, that was good. Thank you very much for for. Uh, attempting this in uh, this round or attempting this in a round is just such beautiful harmonies thank you hello when we sing repeatedly the same words they become more and more meaningful with each each uh, repetition one of the purposes of this church community is to encourage all who gather here to grow more generous in spirit and in action you know, our theme this month is generosity. In addition to supporting this community, we also take a monthly commitment to the wider community. One half of the unidentified cash that's received is given to an outside organization to take an offering that allows us to exercise the all-important generosity of spirit, an offering that will support the self-supporting church and its many ministries. For the month of November, the food bank is the recipient of our contribution. Most people think that giving money is a generous thing to do. Really? Well, yes. There are times when that is the answer. 
Charities, especially those in faraway places, can better meet urgent needs by purchasing food close to the crisis site. Now, our Edmonton Food Bank can make better use of cash to buy cases of wholesale food. Of course, they appreciate the cans of beans and tuna that we give them, but they could buy so much more and serve so many more people with a financial contribution. The money we contribute to the church is necessary and appreciated. For those in the sanctuary, you can use envelopes found in the inside of the hymn book or at the back of the church, just in between the two doors. Uh, and you can uh, insert your contribution, label the envelope, and receive a tax receipt later in the year. Uh, so you indicate your contact information on the envelope. Uh, many of our members and friends give monthly or an annually through automatic withdrawal from their accounts. So if you see the plate pass them by, you can understand that they've already contributed. For those of you online, we encourage you to visit the Edmonton Food Bank website and make a donation. Now the offering will be received. Thank you for your generosity of spirit and action. Now let's sing together from You I Receive. It's time for me, as service leader, to reflect upon our theme this, this month of generosity. The theme we are examining in these Sunday services, generosity, is a very complicated one and very challenging. I'm married to a very scholarly man, so beside my desk, I happen to have Webster's 20th Century Unabridged Dictionary that is six inches thick. <laughs> and there I found generosity on the page in between generation and gener genitals. <laughs> the first definition surprised me. It said, of good and noble birth, excellent. The second definition, of course I'm editing this, uh, nobility of mind, magnanimity, unselfish, bountiful, liberal. And when I read that, I was reminded of the hymn, Good King Wenceslas, because he, he advises all to give, to give to the poor. Now this poem, this tome was published in 1883, and I disagree with the, the most common definitions. Um, we each have our own definition of generosity, and um, it has to fit your own life experience. I think that generosity is made up of three components. First, Reverend Rosemary told us last week that you must identify your personal gifts and realize their value. It could be a talent, a skill, or some abundance that you can share. 
When we do this, we feel empowered. Secondly, you must be sensitive to those in need and learn how you can give in a helpful way without presuming to know. Doing this, we feel connected. And third, you must muster up the energy and courage to follow through and actually commit an act of generosity. Doing so, we feel humbled and grateful to be able to have enough to share. We must be generous with time and space, time to listen, to write that letter, to cook extra servings, to visit, to wait for the slow walker. Giving time can be just the right gift. My good friend is generous with her space. She has welcomed Unitarians in need to live with her, to learn her language, to share her food, and to feel safe. On a much smaller scale, uh, zipper merging is an act of generosity. <laughs> Offering a seat on a crowded bus. Offering your lap to a tired child. I have space in my car for a friend who needs a ride. This is a small but meaningful act of generosity. Now I'll tell you a little story just to finish this up. Um, how many of you are familiar with the group Women in Black? Anybody? Yes, for many years we stood in front of the Strathcona Farmers Market on a Saturday market day, all dressed in black with our banner, standing in silence for a world without violence. And um, uh, this, this was our, our meditation and our gift to the universe. Um, as we began standing there, it became obvious that people wanted to make financial contributions. So we did put a basket next to our banner and people would drop in little bits of money, um, which we always gave to charities that we chose carefully. One day, you know, we got to be on a friendly basis with the homeless people that um, circulated around the market, some selling the street news and others just asking for help. Um, one day, a cold day in the, in the winter, a man stopped. He, was, he had a shopping cart piled high with bottles and cans and bicycle parts and all sorts of junk. He wore a ragged coat, and he had broken shoes. But he smiled and approached our uh, standing demonstration. And he dug deep into a little pouch that was around his waist and pulled out coins, put them in, in our basket. And I still feel moved when I remember that moment, because this was a true act of generosity. And according to the definition in my uh, dictionary, this man did possess nobility of mind, magnanimity, and unselfishness. So let's all express our own generosity in our own small ways. So let's sing together hymn number 1010, We Give Thanks. And my understanding is that even though I know this song, you might not. And so it was written by my friend and colleague, uh, Lu uh, Wendy Luella Perkins. And uh, so I've sung it many times with her, and I encourage, it's in the, oh, you've got one too. You've got a, a teal one too, Ren. Good. Uh, I encourage us to sing it out loud. I will sing it through a few times, and I'll keep, we'll keep, the, I'll keep the mic on so you can follow my voice. And uh, so if you'd like to stand as you are, or rise in body or in spirit and sing together hymn 1010. We give thanks. Maybe, Karen, could you play it through once and so we kind of get the idea? It moves along at a pretty good clip. Ready? Oh, we give thanks. For this precious day, for gathered here and this far away, for the time we share with love and care. Oh, we give thanks for this precious day. Again, oh, we give thanks for this precious day, for all gathered here and this far away, for the time we share. Love and 
For this precious day, oh, we give thanks for this precious day. Well done. Thank you. You know, sometimes I think about doing the meditation differently. And then I stop myself and decide that I'm not. So, in a familiar way, we will be doing the uh, benediction. So, I will bring you into some silence. I will read a poem. And please give me some feedback. Would you like to see something different for the meditation? Is this something that is feeding your spirit to have it done in this way? Uh, so I will bring us into some silence, into some centering. I will read this poem. It's called The House of Belonging by David White. Have a little bit of silence. I will read it again. And then we will have some more shared silence. And we will come out of this silence with the meditation hymn 1031, filled with loving kindness. And after that, we will do our candles of joy and concern. So I am open to feedback, and uh, so you're kind of getting my preferred way of meditating. And so if you'd like to see something different, I am open to your suggestions and your thoughts. So always by invitation, never by demand, I invite you to find this, your center, to sink into the chair that you are sitting in, letting it hold you. Feel it. Know that you are safe in this chair, in this place, that you are in safer and brave space. I invite you to focus in on your breath, to take a couple of deep cleansing breaths, and as you do so, wiggle your body that if it needs to wiggle, and find that Find what feels comfortable in your body. Let your mind wander, if it will, or bring it into stillness, whichever you choose. And just for a couple of breaths, we will have some silence. The House of Belonging by David White. I awake this morning in the gold light turning this way and that, thinking for a moment it was one day like any other. But the veil had gone from my darkened heart and I thought it must have been the quiet candlelight that filled my room. It must have been the first easy rhythm with which I breathed myself to sleep. It must have been the prayer I said, speaking to the otherness of the night. And I thought, this, this is the good day you could meet your love. This is the black day someone close to you could die. This is the day you realize how easily the thread is broken between this world and the next, and I found myself sitting up in the quiet pathway of light the tawny, close-grained cedar burning round me like a fire, and all the angels of this housely heaven ascending through the first roof of light the sun had made. This is the bright home in which I live. This is where I ask my friends to come. This is where I want to love all the things that has taken me so long to learn to love. This is the temple of my adult aloneness as I belong to my life. This is no house like the house. There is no house like the house of belonging. And I invite you into a few moments of shared silence.
The House of Belonging by David White. And in the second reading, maybe you can find another thought or another image that can carry you away. I awake this morning in the gold light turning this way and that, thinking for a moment it was one day like any other. But the veil had gone from my darkened heart, and I thought it must be, have been the quiet candlelight that filled my room. It must have been the first easy rhythm with which I breathed myself to sleep. It must have been the prayer I said speaking to the otherness of the night. And I thought this is the good day you could meet your love. This is the black day someone close to you could die. This is the day you realize how easily the thread is broken between this world and the next. And I found myself sitting up in the quiet pathway of light. The tawny, close-grained cedar burning round me like a fire, and all the angels of this housely heaven ascending through the first glance of light the sun had made. This is the bright home in which I live. This is where I ask my friends to come. This is where I want to love all the things it has taken me so long to learn to love. This is the temple of my adult aloneness as I belong to my life. There is no house like the house of belonging. And a few moments of silence, and then Karen will bring us in to our meditation hymn, filled with loving kindness. And as we continue with our time of quietude and reflection, I invite you to light a candle of joy or concern as you are moved to do so. This has been um, Remembrance Day weekend, and so I have been thinking about my dad as he, um, as he fought in the Second World War and was the wireless operator for the 8th Reconnaissance in, of Saskatchewan. Um, and of an uncle that passed uh, 
he was a pilot and he, his, his bomber, Halifax bomber, went down in the English Channel, died at the age of 21. And so it was always a big deal in my home, Remembrance Day, with medals being polished and my brother putting on his kilt as he was in the pipe band and, and we always went to the cenotaph and, and so I just invite you to keep, let, let us not forget and keep those things in our hearts and minds as well as we um, work towards peace, thank you Marilyn, as we think about the loss and what is happening for us in our own lives and hearts at this time. I invite you to the candle stations. There are two. They are open. I invite you to light a candle of joy or concern. Thank you. Marilyn is lighting a final candle or two to represent all of the joys and concerns in our hearts and to help us think about all those things that we carry with us every day, don't we? There's a lot 
that we carry in our hearts and our minds, that we have experienced, that we hope for, that we desire. May these candles represent those things for you. May you take the light that they, the light with you, as you go. Amen. Oh, we're going to be gifted by a video. Uh, Karen Mills uh, showed me this video, and I think you will love it. It's called. Um, it's by David Gunning, and it is his video, These Hands, and he speaks of generosity. It's merely for your enjoyment. Of the humankind. It's a good question. The reading this morning is by Reverend Steve, Elizabeth Stevens. A simple change of perspective can revolutionize the way we move through life. Instead of focusing on just what we want, we can choose to fo focus on what we want to give. In our personal lives, to live in the spirit of abundance means growing our gifts rather than compensating for a lack we see or that is seen by others. It means building on our strengths what are our gifts? Rather than trying to eliminate our weaknesses, it means asking ourselves, what do I want to offer, rather than what should I get in return? In our ethical decisions, to live in the spirit of abundance means being responsible for ensuring the rights of others. Rather than demanding our own rights first and foremost, it means accepting that most of us occupy a piece of a place of privilege in our society and in our world. Which is not to say we haven't been discriminated against, because most of us have. If we live in the spirit of abundance, though, these experiences lead us to be more compassionate and accepting of others, rather than to feelings of anger or hostility. In our community, leave, living in the spirit of abundance works like magic, she says. When each person gives what is in them to give, be it time, patience, money, presence, or some combination of all three, we wind up with more than enough. Growth and expansion can happen naturally, organically as a result of the gifts of time, insight, and care." End of quote. I remember the first time I was asked to go on the board of the little church, lay-led church I was attending in Victoria. I was stunned. What in the world did I have to offer a congregation, I thought. I had gone to Victoria right after I left my home and my, fam my husband in Kamloops and was working toward becoming healthy and happy again. I said yes, of course. I went, oh, sure, wow, I was pretty chuffed. They want me. Oh. And quickly learned that I enjoyed the work. And so along with being on the board, I chaired the music committee and the worship committee, and I was in the choir, and I filled in for Kim Cousineau, the piano player, when he wasn't able to be there. I contributed to potlucks, help, helped plan events, coordinated and directed the Vancouver Island and Gulf Islands UU summer camp, played piano in the house band, and I also had a full-time job. Someone said something about me not being able to say no. And Dick Jackson, the music director, said, I don't agree. Rosemary can say no without any, very, very easily. She just follows it up with the word problem. No problem. <laughs> I admit, I got a lot of my social and emotional needs met from being in those groups, on those task forces, in those committees. And I also admit that I began to feel ownership 
of Capital Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Victoria, B.C. And that is not a good thing. When anything happened, when someone was not happy about the direction the congregation was going or anything that we did, I was badly hurt. I had over-identified with the congregation, and my boundaries had become extremely fuzzy. I hadn't picked up that it's really important to say yes when you really mean yes, and it's really important to say no when it's the right answer. For some reason, call me crazy, I didn't think that the congregation would be okay without me. I, had, I thought I could, had to steer them and fill in every nook and cranny with my presence. They were very tolerant of me. And they were the congregation that supported me as I entered seminary. And they were there for me, for me in many ways during my formation when I was going, going to Vancouver School of Theology. I am very grateful to them. And they kind of like, Rosemary, you know what? I think you need to let go of a couple of things. How about doing that? So, but what Capital Congregation was doing, and I didn't realize it at the time, was empowering members to take on roles, to learn, to grow, to try out new ideas, to flap energetically their leadership wings. I learned so much about doing church with them. I was learning about shared ministry. What is shared ministry, you might want to ask? I'm glad you did. Shared ministry happens when there is a covenant between each other or between the minister and the congregation, which we have, and when we trust each other enough to look at the different things going on that we're involved with and think about how what is happening is moving us toward living out the vision of UCE. In other words, we trust each other to do and say things that will help us live into our vision. In one article I read on shared ministry, the author asks if leaders in the congregation are actually allowed to lead. It's a good question. I certainly hope so, because we all have a role to play here at UCE in becoming the best we can be. Do you think you're a leader here at UCE? We have five board members, you're leaders. <laughs> Musician, yeah. Um. Have you taken on a leadership role? And I'll, I'll ask another question. Do you now or have ever volunteered for anything here at UCE? Surprise, surprise, you're all leaders. Have you felt like you were leading or merely carrying out a task? Do you feel your ideas were wanted and needed on the task force team or committee or ushering or taking the offering or making coffee or whatever it is? Did you feel like your voice was important? Did you feel like you were valued and honored in doing these volunteer activities, this leadership? There are many ways, there are many here in this congregation working hard to get some very needed teams together to help UCE run smoothly. As we do that, I will need help reminding folks that their voices are wanted and needed. That this is a place where we can try out our leadership wings if you wish to, just like I did at Capitol. They allowed me to just flap away and make all kinds of weird and wonderful mistakes. And they supported me when I went, oh, that didn't work. And I'm like, okay, well, just try again. I know from experience that being part of a UU congregation allows someone with leadership potential to grow, to develop, and hone those qualities. And I'm very excited about what UCE is doing right now. There is a membership task force that has been working hard and has almost completed poli the policies and procedures for a membership team to form and run with. 
really excited about the work that we have done. Thank you to Brandy and others and Karen uh, for being at the helm of that team. There is room for folks to become service leaders and practice their public speaking and writing skills. There are also opportunities for folks that wish to serve quietly behind the scenes. Being part of a congregation is not a spectator sport. I think I've probably said that before. And just like any sport, it doesn't work without a team. And members of a team, you think of a sports team, can't take on too many roles because that obviously wouldn't work. You can't cover first base and shortstop at the same time. What happened to me in Victoria with getting fuzzy boundaries and identifying too strongly with the congregation when there were only a few people on the team, each covering more than one position, besides that, you know, if you do that, we do that, it leaves potential players out. We have to make room. We have to make it clear that there is room for others that wish to play on our team. I'm not actually thinking about anything in particular here, and I'm also thinking about everything. This congregation is growing, and as it grows, it's important to understand that we need to make room for new folks to try out their new leadership wings, to flap them and make mistakes and learn and try and do over and allow those with the skills to lead. Sometimes we have to create a vacuum so that people can actually see there's room for them. And that is hard. We have to sort of, and it's kind of like the same thing on Sunday mornings. You have to sort of guess who might show up and then add about 25% more chairs. Because if somebody comes in and doesn't see a bunch of empty chairs, there is a sense that there isn't room for them. So we have to make room for people if we wish them to enter into leadership with us. There is a story about the Buddha receiving a bowl of rice, and he divided it into the number of days, 49, apparently. He thought it would take him to reach enlightenment. I don't know how he knew that, but somehow he did. So on day 50, he threw the bowl of rice, or the bowl that held the rice, into the river. The Buddhist practice of the alms bowl comes from this metaphor. So the alms bowl, so when you, if you have Buddhists coming to visit, they put out an alms bowl, and that's what they use to live on. Or if you go to a, a sangha, there's an alms bowl. So uh, as the story goes, in places where there was a monastery, a monk would go out and beg, and the monks would live off what was given. Uh, this might not be a very comfortable way to live. However, it is the attitude that goes with the begging bowl that I would lift, like to lift up. In this story, in this metaphor, the bowl is already and always full. The bowl is already and always full. And this metaphor simply allows us to take notice of the plenty that is already within us, in our lives and in this congregation. Reverend Dr. Sandra Fee says, the bowl symbolizes the spirit of generosity and abundance. The bowl is a daily Buddhist practice that has nothing to do with living one's principles, which has everything to do with living one's principles in daily life. I should read more and talk less, I suppose, but that doesn't work for me. So to give without strings is to give from a place of fullness and compassion. It is to give with confidence in the abundance and goodness of life. Gifts without strings, care, support, listening, sharing, these are acts of compassion. They are also acts that promote justice and equity. And she says, may we learn to see that our bowls are already full. May we practice gratitude and be generous for what we have already have in our lives. And out of that spirit of fullness, may we learn to give and also to receive with love and without strings. It's the end of that quote. What if we were to think about UCE as already having everything it needs to fulfill its vision? Because it does. There are about 150 members each 
person has beauty and brilliance and so many important things to give. Maybe your gift is one of legacy. You participated fully, and without you, this congregation would not be in existence. Thank you, Dorothy and Ruth, if you're there. Maybe you are taking on too many tasks and need to share the load. Your na next task, then, is to say no without guilt or the word, like I used, problem with behind it. Maybe you've just started coming to church and wonder how you can get involved. Email me, if you like, or talk to someone that's been here for a while or anyone. My email address is front and center on every email that goes out to you. And it's, if you don't have it, let me know, and I'll give it to you. So following up on the metaphor of the begging bowl, what if we were enough? What if we operated out of a paradigm of abundance and not scarcity? What if we kept our vision front and center in our mind as we made our decisions and carried out our tasks? I've spoken about the vision three times, so I probably should read it. We open doors to all seekers of spiritual growth and nurture positive change for a just and healthy world. If we take our vision, we open doors to all seekers of spiritual growth and nurture positive change for a just and healthy world. We take our vision, the metaphor of the begging bowl and the concept of shared ministry and smoosh them all together, what would we get? Could we say that we would have opportunity to learn things in a caring environment that is overflowing with potential? That's my take on it. What's yours? Let's just take a moment to reflect on this question. And I'll repeat the question. If you could noodle for two minutes, please, Karen, thank you. I forgot to tell you. Sorry about that. So let's just take a moment to reflect on the question, just for a minute or so before we move into our last hymn. I'll repeat the vision, and I'll repeat the question. The vision is, we open doors to all seekers of spiritual growth and nurture positive change for a just and healthy world. The metaphor of the begging bowl that is already and always full. Therefore, we are and have enough. The concept of shared ministry is that we have gifts and potential that can enhance everyone's experience. If we took these concepts and smooshed them together, what would we get? And I'm just going to leave that with you for one, maybe just a minute, because I think we're running out of time. So just about a minute. Just quietly in your seats or in your homes, just think about it for one minute.
Thank you, Karen. Thank you, everyone. I'll end with Reverend Dr. Sandra Fee's beautiful words. May we learn that our bowls are already full. May we practice gratitude for what we already have in our lives. And out of that spirit of fullness, may we learn to give and also to receive with love and without strings. So may it be. Amen. And we'll sing our final hymn. Now let us sing. Apparently I'm picking all the challenges for the day, so lower voices can sing. Now let us sing part. Higher voices sing to the power of the faith within. That's the way it goes back and forth. And there's so many confused looks on your faces. Um, now do we know it? Oh, good. Oh, thank goodness. All right. <laughs> I invite you to rise in body or spirit as you are able and sing our final hymn, hymn 368. Now let us sing. Hello? Uh, it's time to extinguish the flame. And uh, I ask Rosemary Falconer to come forward again. She's one of the most generous people I know, giving of her time and energy and love to family and community and the church. So uh, I'll read these words as she extinguishes our chalice. Blessed by our connections, written by Susan Carlson. We leave blessed by our connections to one another, to the spirit of life. We walk lightly that you see the life that is below your feet. Spread your arms as if you had wings and could dance through the air. Feel the joy of the breath in your lungs and the fire in your heart. Live to love and be a blessing on this earth. Thank you, Rosemary. And I'd like to say thank you to everyone that is here today in person, online, and whenever you are watching on YouTube. I'd like to thank everyone that contributed to making this possible. Thank you, Marilyn and Karen the tech team that are here, ushers, greeters, all of us for making this a possibility this morning. So in deep gratitude for your generosity. And I offer you these words of benediction. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things can break and things can be mended, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So I invite you to go and love intentionally, and love extravagantly, and above all, love unconditionally, for the broken world waits in darkness for the love that is within you. So go, in, go now in peace, gentle people.
go in peace. Let us sing our linking song, Carry the Flame. And um, you're invited to stay for coffee and fellowship afterward.